What's going on everybody? It is Tom with the Nova Digital. I am going to be doing a 2024 update on our studio. Now, the last two years, I have been running a video podcasting studio here in Chicago called Chicago Podcast Studio. Uh, and I made a video about a year and a half ago on YouTube going through what that setup looked like, how we operated things. And at that time, we were just a single set within our studio. And now that we have three sets, we've changed things up a little bit. And today I wanna to cover what sort of changes uh, we made. And so if you're interested in that, sit down, buckle in. It's going to be a good time. If you're interested in this sort of content moving forward, be sure to subscribe. Thanks, guys. When we started this studio, we just had one set and it was actually over here, Studio One. Uh, and what we used to have was a table that housed all of our equipment there. But as we started expanding into a second set, uh, we didn't want to have to buy the same equipment twice. And so what we ended up doing was creating uh, basically a mobile desk. So our same setup, but something that could be on wheels, we could lock it in with casters and then move it throughout the studio. And so, drum roll please, welcome to Megadesk, as it is affectionately called here at the studio. What do we got here? Megadesk. Of course. Command Central, mm -hmm. Surveillance, Gaming, and Business. And so let me dive into what is involved on Megadesk here, but I think it's a pretty impressive design. This is basically our big moving production cart. So while podcasting is the main use of this, uh, it's basically a moving three camera, straight to a recorder, audio included, so we can use it for any type of content creation. But one of the biggest upgrades that we made that I just wanna call out right away, and is a big part of Megadesk, is now we have two FX30s opposed to our A6000 series cameras that we used to use. More on that later. One of the things that has remained the same is we use an A7 III as our center camera. We have swapped the lens on it. Now we use a Tamron 17 to 28. Uh, but we still use this as our center camera to take advantage of that full frame so we don't have as much crop. Okay, and here are two of the other key pieces to our operation. Another one that has stayed the same and another one that has changed. So the thing that has remained the same is the Rodecaster Pro, the first edition. Now we've had experience with the second edition and it's great, um, but one of the, I think, improvements and the selling points of that was the improved uh, preamps. And that is not something that we really struggle with as much because we have a cloud lifter. So we still use the trusty old V1. All right, and another huge upgrade that we went through recently is getting an ATEM Extreme. So we used to have the ATEM Mini Pro, uh, and basically the biggest holdup with that is it only had that single uh, USB-C out, and that started to be a huge buzzkill because basically you could only record straight to the SSD, and it wouldn't allow you to plug into the computer. So we basically upgraded to this, not for all the other buttons and features that this thing offers. We don't even usually take advantage of the other camera inputs, but what we do use it for is we use it for having two USB-C outs, so we can now record directly to the hard drive as well as use the other one to plug into the computer, whether we want to live stream, uh, facilitate things with Riverside or anything like that. And listen, I get it. You might be watching this video and say, Tom, that is way too much equipment. I'm really just trying to start my podcast and I just don't know where to begin. Now, the one thing that I would say that is my recommendation to you is to start with a company like Riverside. And they're actually the sponsor of this video. So we've been using Riverside at our studio for years now. And one of the most valuable parts of it to me is that you're able to record isolated tracks of both video and audio for both you and your guests. Riverside's UI and design is just miles ahead of competitors. And when we send our guests links to Riverside to join our studio. It gives off a real professional, polished experience, unlike a lot of other video conferencing software. Now, while Riverside has remained true to their roots of podcasting, they have also rolled out a whole bunch of new features that are very exciting for podcasters and content creators alike. Another really cool thing that Riverside just rolled out is Show Notes AI. And what this allows you to do is after you record your podcast, it'll generate a list and a breakdown of what you said on the podcast, as well as the timestamps as to when you said things. Now, this does a couple of things for you. It allows you to copy and paste that over to YouTube so that you can already have your chapter set within YouTube. It's a great way to hand off a document to an editor so that they have a better understanding as to where things are within the, the show notes as well. And it gives you a great way to just recap the podcast in a, in a written form so that you don't have to watch the whole thing back to remember exactly what you said. So whether you're just getting started in the podcasting world or you're a seasoned pro, Riverside is designed with you in mind. It's really a versatile platform that grows along with you on your podcasting journey. If you'd like to check out Riverside, please click the link below. They actually have a special offer for you guys as well as a kickback for me, so I would love it if you clicked it. Visit Riverside FM and get started today. Now let's get back to it. And now we use not one, but two monitors. And what's really cool about these is that they will swivel, they will move around, we can move them out to show the guests 
what their setup looks like. Hey, look guys, this is what you look like. It's super great. We can use this uh, for a multitude of things. Another advantage the Extreme has over the regular series is that it allows you two HDMI outs. And so we use both of them. We use one for our um, multi view and then we use one for our program view. But this also would allow you to swap to, let's say if you had a computer plugged in, you could have full screen computer. We can flip this around when we're doing our Riverside podcast uh, and allow that the guests can see the screen share from our laptop. But Basically, this will just track between the cameras uh, and we can switch this to whatever we want, but having two just makes you look a lot cooler and uh, come on, it's mega desk. how could we not? Another key feature and something I haven't really seen done by other people is we wanted to still have some sort of articulation with the cameras. So while this desk is six feet long, we wanted to be able to capture wider than that so we could get a bigger distance between A cam and C cam. Uh, and in order to do that, we bought Elgato boom arms um, and we use them not only for microphones but they pretty much hook up to a camera if you if you rig them well and um, they will hold tight and we're able to boom these out should we need to basically wherever we need across it you can see it moving there um, and we can effectively position this a decent ways out from the desk uh, and that offers us a lot of flexibility that we didn't really have before. Now, one of the things that I don't like about this system is while it has a convenient kind of groove system for cables and such, there's a magnetic plate that sits on top to kind of hold it down. Uh, and I honestly, I do not know what they were thinking. The magnets are not nearly strong enough and there's no locking mechanism. So we often, between moving the cameras around and adding more cables and just adjusting things, they pop off and you gotta put them back on and they're just kind of annoying, but we, we, we survive. One of the more hidden features is our cloud lifter that we've kind of ghettoly strapped underneath the table. Don't look, you luckily can't see it, don't ask questions. What this does is so we don't have to move this either. So basically when we move it to a specific set, all we have to do is take the XLRs that we usually route under the carpet uh, and route them into this. And then these cables go directly into our, uh, whatever it's called, Roadcaster Pro. To cut down on clutter, I wanted to have one power source to power the whole desk. And so we have this pretty massive Belkin power strip and it goes to just one power cable that we need to plug into the wall But this houses everything we need it has dummy batteries for three cameras It has power for the a extreme it has power for the roadcaster pro it has power for both Monitors and I think we actually still have a little bit of space But basically the entire cart is powered with this one power strip the desk itself is by Husky and it is a variable height thing. So it has a crank on this side that allows us to raise and lower the setup as needed. We typically leave it down, but sometimes we have standing presentations similar to this. And so I can just raise it up and that is another huge feature. All right, let's go back to audio here for a minute. So back in the day, we used to run pod mics. Now, the good news about these is that they're cheap. They're like $100 a piece. We bought four of them. We actually think that the sound is really great um, and they actually look really cool. Um, and that is about where it ends. I think as time went on, we decided that as a studio that's a, a a premium studio, uh, we basically had to have the mic that everybody else had. And so we now exclusively use SM7Bs by Shure. Uh, do I think that they are better than the pod mics? Yes. Do I think they're four times what the pod mic is? As Leonardo DiCaprio would say, absolutely not. But I think visually they're just the, what everybody is used to and what everybody expects. Uh, and so now we just have four of them, but $400 a piece versus $100. If you're on a budget, I just go with their pod mics. The lighting at Studio A has mostly remained unchanged, so we still just use an SL60W up top, but one thing that we did do is that we removed the C-stand, and we have, luckily, these water pipes, don't tell our fire department, uh, but we use a variable, a very pole, I think from Impact, uh, to rig up onto the ceiling so that we don't have to deal with it here. We use the same setup um, on our little white paper backdrop that you just saw as well as in studio two now. Uh, but basically this set has remained the same. So it's this main key light. We obviously have RGB lamps on the side. We talked about those are go V just consumer level uh, lamps that we can change the color of and they don't flicker on screen or anything like that, which is great. Um, and then we use these old school, newer bicolor um, panel lights, one foot by one foot as our kind of our hair light. And so this is what makes up the lighting setup at Studio One. So now we're in Studio Two. This is our newer setup and thus we wanted a better visual setup and it needed to accommodate a little bit more of a different seating arrangement. And so we kind of did it 
based off of that, right? So these two lights that you see above me that are suspended on another variable pole are Amaran 100Ds, uh, and they're going into big uh, Godox soft boxes with an egg crate on the other side, uh, and they're kind of in a V shape to spread evenly across uh, both sides of our set. Our hair lights are pink right now for fun and because we use different colors of them. But now one thing that's really cool about this setup that we don't have at the uh, Studio One, which is something that we're gonna wanna improve, is Sidus Link. And when I was shopping for lights and when I first got into this business, I was realizing that you know, it's not that big of a deal, you set the light and forget it, but having everything on a controller and being able to be dimmable, changing it without having to go up there is huge. We have four foot Pavo tubes and they're kind of a pain in the ass to switch through. So the app has been super great for us. We have an iPad that sits on Megadesk and we just kind of oscillate uh, between things as needed. But depending on the seating arrangement, who's there, what's all being shown and stuff like that, we do actually end up modifying our lighting setup pretty consistently. And this is basically what Studio Two looks like. I wanted to go over a little bit of the furniture involved though. So we have two or three, I guess, main pieces of furniture in here. We have these armchairs uh, as our kind of host area or it adds a little bit more prominence to whoever's sitting in those chairs. They're nice big, they're comfortable. We have a podcast that is just two people and they wanna use this space. We can remove the couch and just put the two chairs together and make it work that way. This centerpiece couch, we've done podcasts where the two guests are just sitting on this um, and not use the chairs at all. And so all of this furniture gets moved around quite often. We have a table that usually goes here, but it is super heavy and Colton is not in studio to help out with it. So I'm not gonna move it in here today. And one of the other things that we ended up finally doing here was getting boom arms and doing like a dedicated um, side table basically. So before that we were running with just typical music stands, I guess, for the microphones. And that just visually didn't help. They were increasingly annoying to work with. There was no like, there's no good quality ones. So we just had cheap ones and they'd fall over. You'd have to put a sandbag on them. And so um, while I've somewhat complained about the Elgato boom arms, we have so many of them here at the studio now. And again, the versatility of them is great, even more so than the blue compass arms that we had at studio um, one. We do like these uh, for that reason. They just barely fit on the tables. Uh, and so we kind of had to hand them in uh, but this way basically they will just remain on these stands so we will move them as needed and uh, yeah I guess that's about that there's a big thick rug underneath me to hopefully absorb some of the sound and then we obviously have sound panels behind me and sound panels on the other side of the wall from the camera all right, and so I said I would go back to it. So one of the main reasons that we decided to go with the FX30 as our kind of main cameras opposed to something like an A66, uh, an A7C, or something of those natures uh, was a couple of things. Up until a couple of months ago, my knowledge was that the ATEM could only take a 1080p signal. So I would always have the cameras in 1080p, uh, and I just discovered one day that you could actually feed in a 4K feed. Obviously the HDMI out of the cameras is still locked at 1080, uh, so the ATEM would accept it just fine, but it visually looked better. And for some reason that just didn't make sense to me at the time, but um, it came to the point that let's put all of the cameras in 4K mode, just in their idle condition. Um, and so what we did with that, with the A6, thousand and the a6300 they would overheat um, seeing as they were just smaller cameras even if putting them in 4k idle not recording uh, they would overheat so that was eliminated those and so we needed a camera that wasn't going to overheat depending on if we went for an hour and a half two hours three hours sometimes on podcasts uh, and so the fx30 was kind of the no-brainer because of the built-in fans a little bit more of a rugged um, production standpoint and we're very familiar with the fx3 platform which is what we're shooting on now um, and so for those reasons, we decided that the FX30 would make sense. Now, the reason that we didn't go with full frame is because full frame cameras uh, like the A7C or uh, similar was one, it's usually more expensive to buy those cameras too. And then the things to go with those cameras like lenses are more expensive. And so we went with FX30s and then basically the kit lens that comes on the old school A7Ds. Uh, and then even with the crop, it actually worked out pretty conveniently. We still needed to have zoom capability of our lenses because sometimes we have to get two people on camera. Sometimes we just need one. Sometimes clients want a tighter shot. Sometimes we want a little bit of a wider shot. So 
the 28 to 70, I think it is, off those. Uh, works great. Yes, we could spend a little bit more money and buy nicer lenses, but that'll come with time. Um, but the FX30s basically solved our problem with the overheating issue. They can sit there in 4K30 or 4K60 and stand by indefinitely and seem to just run well. Um, the reason that we maintained having the a7 III as our center camera is again for that full frame capability. We didn't want the crop as much on that. So at our new set here, we have to push Megadesk really close to the wall and still fit someone back there to run the controls so that we can get a wide shot of the four people sitting here. And in order to make that happen basically without going with a fisheye lens, we were gonna have to shoot on a full frame. So that is probably on the chopping block to get replaced next. Uh, but as of now, the a7 III still does a great job. We turn the, the, the temp mode to high uh, and it hasn't been overheating us and it seems to be able to last two hours plus without uh, overheating. And if we have multiple throughout the day, we just turn it off in between uh, to cut down on that time. Now that you know the equipment involved with the podcast studio, let me show you the workflow and the exact details as how everything hooks up together. So from a video standpoint, again, we have these three cameras that feed into our ATEM Extreme via HDMI and then the ATEM Extreme records out from its USB-C into an SSD hard drive and records our video directly to there. In regards to audio, our microphones plug XLR into our cloud lifter for that added DB from the cloud lifter into our Rodecaster Pro, and then from our Rodecaster Pro, it goes over quarter inch over into eighth inch into our A10 Mini Extreme so that the audio and the video is synced up out the gate. Then once you're done recording, the audio and the video are already synced up and pre-cut on the SSD. We take that SSD, plug it into the computer, upload it to drive and send it off to the client. Now from our last video, I know that a couple of you guys were experiencing the same issues with your setup and so hopefully I can answer those questions here. So a lot of people were asking about the uh, record limit on some of the cameras that they can only go up to 30 minutes. Uh, and so the secret to that is that our cameras are never actually recording. So they're simply sitting there in standby and we're pulling their HDMI feed and in, into the ATEM from that standpoint. So the cameras are never actually recording. There's no SD cards in the cameras. Uh, so that is how you dodge that. Another thing that gave me trouble initially that there's not a lot of information out on is how to switch your ATEM mic inputs from a mic level to a line level. And that's very important for the setup that we do and for most people. So you have to go into the ATEM software and actually manually switch what it takes as the eighth inch inputs uh, and switch them from again, a mic level to a line level. And that will clear up a lot of the hiss as well as give you a more healthy level to, to record at. Now, another thing is the ATEM is very particular about what hard drives you use with it. So we, after contacting Blackmagic support, have pretty much exclusively been using Samsung T5 drives. Now they're actually older now. There's a T7 that we've used in the past and it seemed to work just fine, but the internet is kind of, who knows as to as to it, the longevity of that. The T5 has worked for us for two years now and we just, as time goes on, delete some of the old files and allow other files to record there. Transition. So if you're interested in the business side of things and wanna go into it a little bit more depth, there's a couple other videos on my channel and there'll be a couple more videos coming in the near future as to more specifics on that. I know that first video that we did uh, garnered a lot of attention and a lot of people have reached out to me appreciate, uh, being appreciative of what we put together information wise and they've been applying it to their own studios and starting their own businesses and guys I just want to say that that is a huge inspiration to me thank you for taking what we've done uh, and replicating it in your own way uh, it's been really cool to see and it's been really good for the industry as a lot more podcast studios are starting to pop up and so with that guys I'm gonna let the video wrap up here thank you for watching I hope you guys found this as informational as you did video one shouts out again to Riverside for being a sponsor of this video and I hope that they continue to be a sponsor of the channel because we are big Riverside fans here. Please consider subscribing. It really helps out. With that, we'll see you guys in the next one.